Where can uh, the Ukrainians and foreigners meet the ambassador of Canada in Kyiv? Oh, I can't answer that question. Canada needs friends with those interests and, and, and Ukraine is a, is a very important one. Canada is closer than you may think. <laughs>
all of Ukraine. Uh, nowadays, I, I have traveled to many parts of Ukraine on excellent roads. Um, and so I think uh, that is something that has really advanced the ability to get around the country, which I think is really important for tourism, it's important for Ukrainians to know their own country. Um, on the trips that I did here in my working capacity, absolutely, I saw a difference also in how reforms were being taken up, in particular in the security sector. That's the area that, were, that I was working in. And you could see with every visit that the, the principles, the ethos, the commitment was deepening, deepening, deepening. And I think that um, that's a microcosm of what was happening over those years in, in the entire society and the entire government. I, I wanted to ask that you mentioned that you traveled a lot around the country. What's your favorite region in Ukraine? Oh, I can't answer that question. <laughs> it's totally inappropriate, especially since I this year has been such a difficult one and we haven't traveled as much as, as we wanted to. Every place I go, I love. Uh, it becomes my favorite place. Uh, I find something interesting and what surprises me each time is just how unique uh, every region is and how uh, what the people do and the flavor of the place is, is, is different from the last place I was. So the last place I traveled was um, Le Kherson, uh, in watermelon season. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> it gets better than that. <laughs> okay, so let's turn this uh, question into a trickier one. Okay. Let's imagine that the family of a friend of yours from Canada uh, decided to spend a weekend or a vacation, vacation, a vacation in uh, Ukraine. And naturally, they're asking you for advice where to go, what to see, what to eat, and where to do that, and whether it's worth coming to Ukraine, because maybe news about Ukraine they see in Canada and it is not so optimistic. So, uh, how would you promote Ukraine as a destination, as a travel destination? All right. I think I would tag it as sort of ex accessible adventure. Um, uh, there is... Ukraine isn't yet set up for tourists, but it's not scary. There's a lot <laughs> that would be familiar to Canadians. Uh, geography, roads, driving, uh, menus, everything, um, but not necessarily easily accessible because of the language barrier or the lack of signs or what have you. So you could come here, get a real adventure, but not a scary adventure. Uh, you could see something new, you could see something very, uh, go to one area, see, you know, see Lviv, and then go to Dnipro and see a very different kind of, of Ukraine. Um, so I would suggest that they, uh, they try to see some of that diversity of the country, the uh, geographic uh, diversity, the urban-rural diversity, uh, the big cities and small cities. Um, I think that going to the south is really important, uh, especially in fruit season, Kherson in watermelon season. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, see Odessa. I haven't been to Odessa yet, but I cannot wait to go. I hear that it is a very, it is a, a unique standalone city that defies description. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's very cool. Uh, the Karpate are beautiful. And of course, you can't be you can't be Ukrainian Canadian and not tell people that they must visit Lviv. Um, so that would definitely be what to eat in Ukraine. Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> How to explain uh, holodets to a foreigner who never tried it? Um, just to be clear, holodets is uh, what I, I don't know why we often call it studenets. Studenets. Yeah, I don't know why. Hmm. That's interesting. Anyway, but that's the boiled pig feet with meat in it, gel that gets sliced and you eat it with horseradish. Is that what you're talking about? Sounds yes. tasty. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it yeah. is. You should definitely <laughs> try it. Yeah. How would I explain it? Just try it. For the best of explanations. So during the quarantine, for sure, it's uh, quite difficult to speak about the leisure time, uh, but uh, at normal times, uh, where can uh, the Ukrainians and foreigners meet the ambassador of Canada in Kyiv? What are your favorite restaurants, bars, uh, exhibition spaces, walking areas? Where do you love to spend your um, leisure time in Kyiv, if you have any? <laughs> Well, I was lucky to have a few months where I could very easily and freely and safely explore the city. But 
before everything got locked down. And as you can imagine, as, as an ambassador, I have to take my own health very uh, yeah. seriously uh, and also show a good example for uh, the people that I, that I work with um, of, of how to stay safe. So I have to say in the last eight months or so, it's been very, very difficult. But before that, um, uh, uh, I loved finding new walkways, you know, going in behind the building and seeing what's there. Um, Cave is a beautiful city, a gorgeous city. Uh, walking on the street is one thing, but if you duck into the uh, views, you see a whole other little piece of that in the middle of the block. So I love doing that, just popping in and, and, and finding something new. Um, I like the bars, very good cocktail bars, a very evolved bar culture in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And I think that the harder it is to find the bar, the more interesting the experience is going to be. Um, so that was uh, fun. Um, nowadays, uh, I live near the old botanical gardens. This, uh, uh, and I like walking through there at any season. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. You hardly feel like you're in the middle of a big city. And probably my favorite park in all of uh, in all of Kiev is Shevchenko Park. Mm -hmm. I love it. I never fail to walk through there and smile or, or, or laugh or, or see something new or interesting. Uh, all kinds of people, all kinds of events, musicians, um, art. Uh, children, unicorns, there are unicorns in the Chip Park. Um, so I, uh, I love it, I, I really like it. And, and in fact now, because we can't meet in person, oftentimes my meetings are a walk through Chip Park. When Ukrainians uh, think of the most uh, Ukraine-friendly nations, Canada comes to mind uh, month four, the first because Canada was the first Western country to recognize Ukraine's independence, and there are a lot, there are a lot of things that makes uh, that make Canada a true ally to Ukraine. It's an open-minded government. It's a, a huge weight in the inter international arena. It's a um, big level of economic growth. All of this makes Canada way too important for Ukraine. What makes Ukraine important? ally of Canada? Great question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me take uh, this answer on, on a few levels. First, let's step back and let's look at our interests because we have common interests, not just bilateral interests, but we are both democratic countries of about the same size. We are both countries that live next to very large world powers, and in Ukraine's case, Russia and the European Union. We have economies that rely on uh, trade, and, uh, and we are big supporters of the multilateral system. Countries like ours, we rely on that multilateral system, on the rules-based inter international order, organizations like the World Trade Organization or the United Nations to level the playing field so that we can compete as middle-sized countries against the very big ones. And so together we have an interest in the world in those institutions that level the playing field. So Canada needs friends with those interests and, and, and Ukraine is a, is a very important one. Let me also answer the question from a values perspective. And I'm gonna take this from, from Canada's perspective. You know, Ukrainians first started immigrating to Canada in the late 1800s. And immediately upon arriving in Canada, they integrated themselves into the decision-making structures. They became politicians, members of parliament. They became senators. We've had two governor generals with, uh, with Ukrainian roots. They became provincial premiers, mayors of big towns, um, uh, researchers, leader, leads in academic institutions. They rose to the level where they were shaping what Canada was. And so uh, from a values perspective, we feel ourselves very close to Ukraine, not because of who Ukrainians are today, but because of the Ukrainians that came to Canada and that worked hard to shape what Canada is today. So there is a natural affinity. There is a, a, a natural coincidence of values uh, that exists. And so it makes Ukraine an easy ally as well. 
Uh, finally, I would say that from a political, an economic and a security perspective bilaterally, uh, Ukraine is an important ally for, for Canada. There's a lot that is happening here in Ukraine that Canadians can learn from. I'll give you an example. The Canadian Armed Forces, we have a 200 person training mission here. They're here because we have an interest in Ukraine's security and territorial integrity and we want that restored as soon as possible. And so they do tactical training uh, for the units that are going to go and fight on the front. But those units are also having an experience that Canadian soldiers don't have and we're learning from that experience. Ukraine is on the front lines of a hybrid war and we know that that hybrid war easily reaches across the Atlantic and around the world but here we can learn so much about it. So that's that's another example of how Ukraine is a, is a very important ally for Canada. Canada indeed strongly supports Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and you, Madam Ambassador, have um, led the direction of peacekeeping operations and stabilization in the uh, MFA of Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And your appointment, I think, is a kind of manifestation of big Canada's attention to Ukraine, which is really, really great. But does it also mean that Canada is ready to go deeper into the peace process in Ukraine uh, using your personal experience. I like to think that I bring my personal experience to that job and to understanding the, the conflict dynamics, to understanding what makes a strong peace process and to understanding just how long and deep a process uh, that is. Um, Ukraine has itself gone more deep and broad and more open about its peace process, much more active um, in, in the last little while. And, uh, and Canada here, like other diplomatic missions, is here to accompany Ukraine on that journey. And, uh, and we'll bring what we can to it. Uh, from my previous job, uh, a couple of things uh, come to mind. First is the knowledge that uh, women need to be more involved. More women are involved in peace processes, whether they're the formal peace processes or the informal ones, the stronger the outcome is going to be. We will probably come back to the end, uh, to the gender uh, question a bit later, but uh, as for the peaceful negotiations and as for the peaceful talks, would you personally like to break into those uh, peaceful negotiations and participate in them more actively? And uh, um, do you think that um, the political will and the expertise, as they say, are enough uh, for these uh, peaceful negotiations to be successful? Political will and expertise are really important. They're really, really, really important, but they're not enough. There's a third element that's required, and that is political legitimacy. And, uh, and so a country negotiating its peace process must know that its population is behind it. If you don't have political legitimacy, you don't have sustainable peace. You may be able to end the war, but you won't be able to sustain the peace. So how do you get that political legitimacy? You get it through dialogue, you get it through real engagement, not just telling people what you're going to do, telling people what you're taking into negotiations, but talking to them about it, explaining it, but also hearing what their perspectives uh, might be. All of that enriches a peace process along with the expertise. Unfortunately, there's, there are a lot of experts in the world uh, 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 on, on how to negotiate peace because there's a lot of peace that needs to be negotiated. Um, political will is very difficult to keep up, um, but those three things together are a very powerful force. And uh, th that generation of, of credibility uh, and legitimacy is something that through our programs at the embassy we're able to support and we do support organizations that want dialogue, organizations uh, that want to help counter disinformation, uh, creating platforms, uh, f f translating books, uh, what have you, little things that we can do to help generate that political uh, legitimacy help the Ukrainian authorities set the stage for not just the end of the war but a sustainable peace. Mm -hmm. Is the Canada deeply involved in activities uh, within the uh, Crimean platform? 
uh, the new format established uh, for negotiating peace. We've been invited to join the Crimea platform and we're very pleased about that. And actually President Zelensky and Prime Minister Trudeau had a conversation about it, I think back in December, back in September. Uh, it is an excellent initiative and we really welcome it. Uh, the idea that Ukraine will formalize a structure to keep talking about all the elements of uh, Crimea, its annexation and its ultimate return to to Ukraine. Um, it's really important that Ukraine own it, Ukraine structure it, and that it keeps going for as long as it needs to. So we, we welcome that. The structure is still being put together. We look forward to seeing how we can play a role. It's going to be very multifaceted from experts on very small matters of, of very minute details of international law to summits where leaders of countries will come together to highlight um, the issues uh, and everything in between. And so I have, I have no doubt that there will be room for Canada there. <laughs> Surely. Pandemics changed a lot the world we live in, the way we travel. Uh, many countries uh, introduced some restrictions uh, and introduced rules in which they opened their borders to foreigners. But let's hope that all the uh, restrictions are temporary and soon we'll go back to normal. And let's remember that one of uh, the issues in the bilateral agenda was the introduction of um, visa uh, liberalization regime. So where are we now? What criteria should Ukraine uh, meet to get into the visa free list for Canada? We love it when people come to visit Canada and especially when Ukrainians want to come and visit Canada. You know, last uh, in 2019, let's use those numbers because 2020 numbers are don't count. 2019, 22.1 uh, million visitors came to Canada and there were 341 new immigrants to the country. Um, and we're delighted with the immigrants. We're delighted with the uh, with the interest in visiting Canada. But what's really important is that all of those visitors and immigrants come respecting the laws and the policies for people coming into Canada. And, uh, and, and there are many ways that you can come to Canada. You want to work, you want to study, you want to do business, you want to invest, you want to visit your family, you want to come look after your grandchildren for a while. There's all different ways that you can come. And so our interest is in making sure it's as easy as possible for Ukrainians to come to Canada using the right vehicle, using the right route, using the right kind of permission. And so there are many things that we can do, I think, and, and, and this year we're going to get more deeply uh, into these questions. We're, we'll segment the population a little bit. Students. What can we do to make it easier for students to come to Canada? What can we do to make it easier for youth to move back and forth, including for Canadian youth to come here and, and work? What can we do for business travelers? Uh, what can we do for people who want to come to Canada on an internship? So we need to look at these things and uh, at these different kinds of travelers, different kinds of interest in coming to, to, to Canada and make sure it's as easy as possible for people to understand what the requirements are, how to apply, what the rules are when they're in Canada and how to make sure that those rules are respected. So I think that that's a cooperation that we're going to have for, uh, to make it easier for uh, for Ukrainians. I'm really excited about the Youth Mobility Agreement. This isn't just a piece of paper that says, hey, Ukrainian government and Canadian government want youth to go back and forth, because youth do go back and forth. This is much more significant than that. It allows, a Youth Mobility Agreement allows, will allow Ukrainian young people to go to Canada for a year find a job once they're there, travel, maybe they want to ski in Whistler and work at a restaurant, um, or they want to live in downtown Toronto and serve coffee, uh, they can go and they can do that. Likewise, Canadians can come here, and I think this is going to be a prime destination uh, spot for Canadians under the Youth Mobility Agreement. But the laws aren't in place yet to allow that in Ukraine. 
Uh, and so we need to work with members of the Verkhovna Rada, with the ministers responsible, with the government, with other authorities, to see how we can make that happen um, so that it can be successful for both Ukrainian and Canadian youth. Sure, Canadians can have a great gap year here in Ukraine, I'm sure about Fabulous gap year, absolutely. <laughs> I've met some who are here who are doing just that. I've met some who came here for a little while, loved it, felt so comfortable that they have stayed longer. And it's not just you Canadians who have a Ukrainian heritage. It's Canadians have no Ukrainian blood at all, but feel comfortable, probably for a lot of the reasons I talked about earlier. They feel comfortable, that they feel that there are opportunities and possibilities here that they don't necessarily have at home, and so they're going to live a chunk of their young life here. Um, it's important that they do it legally. <laughs> sure. Uh, for the last 10 years, have you spotted the tendency, uh, is the number of Ukrainians who would love to move to Canada from Ukraine uh, is increasing? Well, I don't know if the number uh, that would love to move to Canada is increasing, but I can tell you what the statistics are for, for, for immigrants, and they have gone up. From, uh, from in 2015, it was about 2,500 immigrants, uh, permanent residents were from Ukraine, and uh, more recently, it's up over 3,000. Um, so it has gone up about, I don't know, 20, 25%, um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens in the future um, but there are you know there's there are strong pulls to Canada um, and uh, and U Ukrainians are very good immigrants uh, to Canada as uh, as over a century of immigration has proven to us. Madam Ambassador, do you buy Ukrainian stuff? Uh-huh, yes, <laughs> yes. What goods you buy here you would like your friends in Canada uh, would be able to buy? Uh, I think that Ukraine has a fabulous fashion industry. Uh, I think the footwear, the jewelry, the clothing, these are the things that I go out and buy. I buy art uh, as well and textiles, you know, pillows, uh, cushions, uh, blankets. So uh, my family and friends are very familiar with all of this because that's what comes home for Christmas uh, for, for the gifts. Uh, yes, um, food is excellent. Uh, we already buy a lot of Canadian, of, of Ukrainian apple juice. Um, so uh, yeah, there's many, many, many things. Mm -hmm. uh, so since the 1st of August in 2017, um, the FTA, the free trade agreement between Ukraine and Canada is in force. Uh, but right now, one of the main questions between uh, the two countries is uh, the FTA revision and uh, modernization. So uh, where does this uh, attempt to, to revise and modernize the FTA uh, stem from? Hasn't the agreement uh, live up to the expectations? I would say the agreement has absolutely lived up to expectations. The point of a free trade agreement is to uh, diversify our access to a market and to have preferential access to markets. And that's what this agreement has done between Ukraine and Canada. Um, the other point of an agreement is to make sure that everyone benefits, that the benefits of a free trade agreement are, 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 are spread out in our societies. Um, from the day, right in 2017, as soon as this, this agreement was signed, Ukraine's exports to Canada increased by 70 percent. Uh, uh, over the course of the two, three years of the, that the agreement has been in place, Canada's non-coal exports to Ukraine have increased by 28 percent. So this agreement has worked really well. In fact, it's worth, were, worked better than most free trade agreements. We're happy with it. Uh, but the agreement had written into it a clause that said after two years we should look at it again and see what more is needed. And there were things that weren't included in, in, in the first uh, KUFTA, we call it, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Um, in particular, trade in services. Uh, and this is going to be a big part of these discussions going forward, is uh, telecommunications, financial services, IT services, uh, and uh, I think that there are a lot of common interests, and not just in trade, but also in collaboration and the innovation that these sectors in Canada and Ukraine can do together. Right now, do you spot a lot of Canadian goods in Ukraine, here in Ukraine? I spot some obvious ones. The other day, driving down the road, I saw a whole load of Bombardier uh, 4x4 uh, vehicles. Uh -huh. 
Um, I uh, see in this cold weather that uh, Canada goose parkas are prominently displayed in store windows. And of course, every grocery store has uh, maple syrup in it. So <laughs> yes, I'm reminded of uh, Canadian products uh, uh, often. Great. And don't forget about shrimps and hake. <laughs> oh, and shrimps and hake. Thank you very much. That's right. 70% of Ukraine's imports of frozen uh, cold water shrimp are from, from Canada. Canadian shrimp. Because that's an Canadian interesting fish. Fact. Canada is closer than you may think. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it is. It it's is. in your freezer section of your grocery store. <laughs> uh, and an ambassador, do you go to see Ukrainian movies? I do. Do you think Ukrainians learned how to make good movies or do they still lack some experience? Ukrainians make amazing movies, really great movies. Uh, I've, uh, I recently saw, the last one I saw was uh, called Yuki. Uh, I'm somewhat biased about how amazing that movie is because it's about uh, uh, NHL hockey players in Canada who have Ukrainian roots. Um, but I also watched some movies, uh, Ukrainian movies, on the uh, Odessa Film Festival. Mm -hmm. They're fabulous. They're fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I've been to film.ua to see the studios and to see all the technical capabilities. So not just the actors and the sets, but the dubbing and the, uh, the, the, the animation and all of the, the technical expertise. It's fabulous. Is it on the Canadian agenda to extend our cooperation to the creative industries and movie making? We just did. As of January 1st, uh, we have uh, Canada and Ukraine have a co-production agreement in place. So for the last few years, we've seen some good movies come out of co-production agreements between the two countries. People know Bitter Harvest. Uh, they know there was a. I watched a, a short at the Odessa Film Festival called Goodbye Golovin, uh, also a co-production. And of course, Yuki. I hope everyone sees that. That was a great movie. Uh, but as of the 1st of uh, January, we now have a formal co-production agreement. And what that means is that when uh, Canadian and Ukrainian producers are cooperating, they're going to be able to take advantage of the incentives, um, the financial benefits, and everything else that goes along with movie making in both countries. Uh, so this is a huge advantage to filmmakers. Uh, Canada uh, does about, has about there's about 60 co-productions a year with up to 58 different countries uh, that we have these agreements uh, with. So we know, our, our producers know how to do this. Our, our industry is very used to dealing with counterparts in other countries. Ukraine, for its part, has a very rapidly uh, uh, developing film industry, uh, top-notch talent, uh, great locations, and uh, and we think that there are lots of innovation. We think there's going to be a really good partnership between uh, between the two. We're looking forward to that. Me too. Me too. Do you always feel comfortable in the meetings with the Ukrainian government officials when they assure you that all the reforms are fine, they're going in the right direction, with the right pace, and deeply inside you know that that's not always so.